Good morning. Well, Good morning. Hello. What time is it now exactly? <laughs> <laughs> How is everyone? <coughs> so Welcome to the Anne and Phelan Scoop. My name is Anne McElhenney. And I'm Phelan McAleer. And a, qu a quick question here, by the way. How many people here uh, listen to podcasts? You see, you know what that is, by the way? That's the Mark Stein Cruise Group, you see. A more sophisticated than the average. Yes. You know, that's actually the yes. truth. So, well, we're doing, a, this is a very unique, uh, uh, as Andrew said, it's a very unique setup. Uh, it's a kind of a, an Anglo-Irish cooperation where mm. we're, our podcast, Mark has very kindly handed over in a sort of pre-Brexit backstop <laughs> Anglo-Irish cooperation, <laughs> handed over his show to our... Uh, control of his show. Uh, yeah. Control of his show to our podcast. Very backstoppy. Which is the Alan yeah. Taylor Scoop. So so this is like a live backstop, uh, yes. in fact. Uh, so any children um, perhaps should maybe leave yeah, when yeah. I just say, I never thought of the word backstop in a sexual until way. He until he started. Until he started no, the he other started. night. <laughs> and now I can't get it out of my mind. No, so. no, no. No, no. no. <laughs> They'll have whole sections for it in the shadier bookstores yes, yeah, yeah. of Ketchikan <laughs> by the time we get yes. there. So, welcome to the Alan Film Scoop. I have to have Mark's bio here because he's so accomplished, mm. so I'm, I'm going to be reading some of it. Mm. But our very special guest today is Mr. Mark Stein, and many of you watching out there will know who he is, but for those, uh, we'd like to introduce him. I think this group is yes, probably, <laughs> probably <know>. more aware <laughs> than the yes, average We're group. on the Mark Stein, because we're on the Mark Stein cruise to Alaska. So the best way to think about Mark Stein uh, is to think of Dennis Healy, uh, the mm. former Chancellor of the Exchequer. Uh, he, uh, he was who, a... Who, who, who 10% of the audience oh, no, are this very the, familiar This is the Mark Stein Cruise. This is the, they, they, we all know who Dennis Healy is. Well, Dennis Healy was Any the, Dennis Healy fans in the house today? Yeah, yeah, come yeah, on! Yeah, 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 yeah. So, <laughs> Dennis Healy was a, a man of the left, a former member of the British Communist Party, actually, yeah. uh, who also served in Anzio. Uh, but he had a huge interest in music, painting, and poetry, and he attributed his life, his success in life and politics, to having a hinterland. Uh, an interest in a life outside politics. And to me, that sums up Mark Stein. You know, he is so successful and so accomplished because he has many hinterlands. In fact, you could say his hinterlands, his hinterlands have hinterlands. Have hinterlands. <laughs> you know, so, so who is he? Born in, he was born in Canada, spent his early career in the UK. Um, I probably am missing some of your uh, newspaper achievements here. Musical theatre critic at The Independent, uh, film critic of The Spectator, where he was a colleague of some person called Boris Johnson, oh, yeah. I believe. Uh, <laughs> later became a political columnist at the Daily Telegraph, written for every major newspaper on the planet, I would say. Uh, OC Register, Irish Times, Jerusalem Post, National Post, it, the list goes on. Uh, so his interests and books include Broadway. He's written Broadway, Babes Say Goodnight, musicals then and now, a history of the musical theater. In my opinion, one of the greatest, he's one of the greatest living obituary writer, writers. <laughs> I, it's one of my favorite books. And I, we'll be asking you some questions on it later on. Um, his books on the demographic and cultural and financial decline of the West, uh, America Alone and After America, are international bestsellers. And I think it's safe to say he's the only New York Times bestselling author who also has a cat-themed album yeah. uh, in the Billboard Top 100, Feline Groovy, yeah. featuring Mark on vocals. Most people, however, most people watching this will know Mark from his frequent guest hosting on the Rush Limbaugh show and on the Tucker, and his very funny appearances on the Tucker Carlson show. His did, everyone, <coughs> did everyone see the Joe Biden story, the Joe Biden war story? Classic, it's a classic. Classic it's telly. Yeah, yeah. Classic telly. Classic telly, the best thing yeah. ever. So these, these high profile gigs on, on Fox and Rush have made him probably the most successful Canadian in the US political scene since Ted Cruz won the uh, <laughs> Iowa primary in the 2016 election. So, um, so welcome, yeah. Mark Stein. Thank you, and thank you, for <laughs> Great to be uh, yeah. great to be. How yeah. are you? I'm, uh, I'm great. I'm loving the cruise, and I like nothing better than sitting and listening to my biography. I could just sit here for four <laughs> <laughs> Feel free to do another 20 minutes on yeah, that. Yeah, I love exactly. it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, we could do the whole, we could do it like an hour just uh, of the biography. Um, so our first 
we, we virtually met for the first time in February 2007, and I think right. you'll probably you have a yeah. great memory. I turned 50, I can't remember anything. But, um, <laughs> but you wrote about us in the OC Register right. back in the day, because our first independent documentary was Mind Your Own Business. Right. Um, and you wrote very, very kindly about us, and that's how, we, that's mm -hmm. how our, our friendship started. And I think then the very first time, I feel like the very first time we met was actually up in Burlington, where we had... Um, that, that interview no, I we think, did. I think actually we met in a courthouse, oddly oh, enough. Oh, we did yes. meet in a courthouse. Um, Sorry, yes. And very kindly for uh, the DC uh, Court of Appeals, which is a... <laughs> a Michael Mann. Uh, uh, in, as part of the interminable torpor of this Michael Mann climate change case has been going on for seven years now. And, and what I loved, because I, I, as I've said to a few people here, I think Americans are too deferential to judges. And I loved, Anne and Phelim arrived. <laughs> I know. And they come into the courtroom, and they, uh, and like, Phelim's had, like, a long flight from Los Angeles. He's, like, a little, uh, you know, he's a little thirsty. He's, uh, it's been a stressful flight. He just goes up to the pitcher of water that is reserved for their lordships, or whatever you call them in the US, and helps himself to, uh, and takes this huge pitcher of water and leaves like about... Uh, I did leave something. An, an ounce and a half for, for the uh, three appeals judges between. That's how to treat judges. Yeah, yeah, that's absolutely, that's yeah. absolutely right. I love it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, and that, that case has been really, really rocking along, right, Mark? Yeah, it's, uh, it's great. They, uh, How many years ago was that? Uh, it's, it started seven years. It's a 270-word blog post, uh, and it's been litigated now for over seven years. Fabulous. Um, I'm unlikely to live to see it resolved in my lifetime, so it'll be, it'll be Michael Mann versus the state of Mark Stein by the yeah, time yeah, there's yeah, an yeah, actual exactly, verdict. Exactly, exactly. I want to go back to the biography, actually, because I think this Lord Healy quote is so perfect and I think there's something so unique about you, Mark, that, you know, if you think about it, we were, some of us were on the cruise last year, and, you know, we started, and, and I think you actually announced the, 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 pre, the first cruise quite late, mm. and so, you know, there was a whatever number of us there were, but there was time for the next cruise, and I mean, there was people, like, like basically self-harming themselves. <laughs> I missed the Mark Stein cruise, you know? So they didn't miss it this time, and obviously they had to have a cutoff and everything. And I think the reason that people are here in such numbers, and I think you could have three times filled this boat, by the way, with Mark Stein fans. The only thing is the problem with this, obviously, the, the, the room here, we couldn't fit any more people in, is because of your hinterland. Mm -hmm. And actually, that's, I think, what... It, and it's an interesting... Um, I just think it's an interesting thing, because I think there's so much on the right about punditry, there's so much punditry and a great punditry, mm. fabulous. It's all great and lovely and everything. But you know, people like music, people like poetry, people like stories. They like nothing more than talking about Miss Saigon. You know, this is what people actually really like doing. And watching bad television are one of our favorite things. Why is it? <laughs> why is it? Have you any kind of explanation for the fact? And I thought it was interesting what, what was spoken about yesterday about British politicians having a hinterland like Dennis Healy, like mm. Julian Fowles. Mm. What's wrong with the American politicians that don't have hinterlands? Well, you know, I, I, think, it's a, I think in a way some of it's driven by the rise of uh, the left and government because to the, to the left wants big government because in the end on the left everything is about government. Uh, that's, that's the whole point of it. So everything becomes political, everything becomes government. The conservative position, the, the proper conservative position is you have the government you need to enable you to live your life. Life is where all the fun stuff is. And it doesn't have to be the things I, you know, I'm a bit of an uh, effete Canadian show tunes boy, but you know, Rush, people, people at Rush, for example, loves football. Yes. Uh, by which I mean not real football failing, but... Yeah. Uh, <laughs> what they call, for some reason, American football. And actually, one of the... Uh, the, the Rush and I... He once asked me a question about football, because Rush always takes the day after Super Bowl Sunday off. So um, I'm there always on the Monday morning after uh, Super Bowl Sunday, having to talk about this thing that's happened the day before. And I'm doing my best. I'm bluffing. Uh, I'm pretty convincing. I, was, I, thought, I thought the... Uh, I thought the uh, Janet Jackson number during the seventh inning stretch was really terrific. 
I got the crowd with me all the way, and then I'll make some fatal error, and everyone will know I haven't a clue what I'm talking about. <laughs> and uh, and, uh, and pe but people complain when Rush talks about Rush has a, a life, and football happens to be what he likes, and you know tap dancing or Elton John. Uh, yeah, he likes he likes Elton uh, he likes Elton John. And, and life, life is where life is lived. And so getting excited because this particular candidate is up two points in a swing district in Iowa is not really where life is lived. And if you live in New Hampshire, as I do, I think you feel it particularly strongly because you get to know every single political candidate far better than you would ever want to know anyone. You know, I don't know my children as well as I know Phil Graham because he camped out outside my house when he was running in 1996. And I don't want to know Phil Graham. No. I'm like ashamed I remember him. And all these, <laughs> all the, so you get to know, the, and you realize just in the great churn of these uh, uh, candidates who, who come through again and again, Lamar Alexander. Lamar <laughs> Alexander, who's, do you know Ooh. Lamar Alexander? God he had this slogan, ABC, Alexander beats Clinton. Remember your ABC, oh. Alexander beats Clinton. And the first time I saw him in a diner, in two, I thought, oh, yeah, that's quite cute. Uh, by the time I'd heard it, the 147th time I bumped into him in the diner, uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't cute. And that's not really... Those people, all, for a start, those people will always let you down. All your yep. political heroes have yep. feet of clay. And, and in the same way, um, your, your musical heroes or your sporting heroes certainly do not let you down on anything like the same scale. So if you're going to be emotionally invested in someone, it's much better to be emotionally invested in, uh, in, in a... Uh, a great sportsman or a, a great explorer or a great composer uh, than it is with some guy who's running in the New Hampshire primary. Because that guy is going to screw you over at some point. He's always going to do it. Yeah. It's funny, actually. We went to a town hall last week of Ted Lou. You know Ted mm. Lou, right, in California? Democratic Congress. Um, <laughs> actually, yes. Yeah, some a lot of, of fans. Some... Yeah, impeach him. <laughs> Impe <laughs> peach him. Peach him. And... Uh, and I think I sort of whispered to Phelan at the very beginning of it, and I said, you know, and I literally, I mean, you know, I said, God, I hope he doesn't do that dishwasher. My father was a dishwasher thing, you know? <laughs> and I said it as a joke. You know that thing of, my father was a dishwasher. And it's like, <laughs> right? I kid you not. He opened up and he said, my father came to this country as a dishwasher. And I'm thinking, I was joking about that. Uh. So, so their, version, so their version of a hinterland is, my father was a dishwasher, yeah. and it's like, no, this is what I think is so attractive about Trump. I'm a gazillionaire, I am yeah. so yeah, rich. Yeah, yeah. And it's like, yeah, 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 yeah. lovely, I love it, you know? It's like, oh, isn't that refreshing? I mean, Phelan tells that story about Trump that I love the one about, you know, where he comes out on stage at some stage and he sort of said to people, do you have any idea what I'm sacrificing doing this, running for president here? Well, I, I, you I know, Mark, do you have yeah. any idea, do you have any idea? And he tells this story, maybe, maybe it's probably one of Mark's stories. It's yes, one of Mark. You see, you tell, <laughs> so Phelan reads Mark's thing, and then he tells me the story, and then I think it was yours. Uh, and I, and I, don't, I don't put her off. And he doesn't put me off. But yeah, so it's a great story where he basically said, you know, I mean, I, this morning, you know, I, like I drove my, like I drove my, you know, my Rolls Royce and whatever thing. And it, right. it just struck me. It just struck me. If I win the presidency, I'll never drive my Rolls Royce again. <laughs> so that's the kind of person, that's what I'm willing to do for this country. That's how much of a patriot I am. And it's like, you know... And wait, people wait, are like so relieved. People are so relieved. They're like, "Oh my God, thank yeah. this guy, great!" I, when he you, when he did that line, I saw him do that line in Burlington, Vermont, which is the capital city of Bernie Stan. So he's right in the enemy's heartland. And people who had like guys who drive uh, 1992 F150s <laughs> and women who drive secondhand 1984 Toyota Corollas were weeping at that Rolls Royce line. <laughs> 
<laughs> because he's not, I'm proud to say I was the son of a dishwasher. He, yeah. he like, cut away from all yeah, yeah. that and just was who he was. Well, the, yeah. con the consultant class would have told him not to say that. Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. And it's like, I mean, that was what, I mean, I think that was what killed it for Mitt Romney. You know, it was like, he basically, you know, oh, yeah, I know. Whoever groaned there, we should all groan. I mean, Mitt <laughs> Romney. Oh, I mean, wh how, how sad, you know, the guy was embarrassed for being wealthy, you know. He was yeah. embarrassed for being successful. What a, you know, yeah. what a disaster. So, let's, um, let's talk about... Your dear friend. Your, your dear friend, your old colleague. And actually, my, I can call, claim him as my boss because I once wrote a freelance article for The Spectator oh. and received 175 quid for it. Really? Uh, and Boris well, that's it. 75 more than I got. <laughs> <That's>, uh... <laughs> Boris put the very uh, catchy headline of it on it. Happy hookers of Eastern Europe. <laughs> he did. <Yeah. laughs> it's, you know, an, it's a true thing. That's a true thing. You, you can, can look it up. You, you can look it up. Yeah. Happy hookers of Eastern Europe. My, the only collaboration between myself <laughs> and Boris Johnson. But he's an old colleague of yours. Well, he has, let's say he has quite a hinterland himself. Um, yes. Why Dis are you, discuss. Why, no, why are you skeptical of him? Uh, uh, well, uh, I, am I, I correct? I think, I think the, th the, the thing about... Bo Boris is a kind of... Uh, Genius. Uh, I, the Spectator used to hold because um, the Spectator used to hold these very convivial lunches. I think it was every Tuesday afternoon. And lunch, in a in the British sense, is a term of art that can stretch to five, six, seven o'clock in the evening. Lunch. Uh, Alexander Chancellor, the the former editor of the Spectator, uh, and he was brought over to New York to work at the New Yorker for, for a bit. And he was horrified to learn that in America, lunch is a short period in which you're required <laughs> to eat uh, sufficient food to get you through a full working afternoon. So he was completely baffled at the idea that it didn't go on till five, six, seven o'clock in the evening. And people were like eating salads at their desks and not consuming at least three bottles of wine over lunch. So, um, so the spectator lunches were different. And one time, uh, uh, we were all sitting around having lunch. Boris was late. Uh, he arrived about 40 minutes late. He pushed open the door, and we all looked up, and he goes, sorry I'm late, but I just woke up this morning, and I had this incredible vision. I realized I was going to be prime minister one day. And, and we all burst out laughing. <laughs> <laughs> Well, who's laughing now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so I... He's a ruthless person, and he's... Lots of people want to get to the top of uh, the greasy pole, as Disraeli called it. Um, and, and I think there's a difference. Theresa May, certainly since I first came across her in the 90s, has always wanted to be prime minister. That was her ambition, to become prime minister. Uh, the point is, what do you do when you get yeah. there? It's, yes. the, Joe Biden has the same problem. He can't explain why. He wants to be president because, you know, you get a, there's a big portrait in the White House and yeah. you're there. In the, but he can't actually explain, other than that, why he wants to be there. Hillary at the same time. And, Hillary, and yeah, same, with the same. Hi, same with Hillary. My and the point, the, the point about Theresa May is she wanted to be prime minister. Boris is so ruthless, he wants to be a great prime minister. He thinks he is Churchill. But isn't it, uh, isn't it, but isn't it great that he wants to be a great prime minister? And isn't his ruthlessness perhaps exactly what's needed right now because what's happened in Britain yeah, is I, extraordinary. Ab absolutely. I think the idea, and again, I think that's to the, the change. They used to, people didn't used to be impressed by prime ministers. There was, there was, like, there was a joke in, uh, there was like a joke, a, a British joke years ago about two brothers in, in Wales, uh, tw twin brothers. One ran away to sea, uh, and the other became Prime Minister of Canada and was never heard from again. And, <laughs> and the, uh, the idea being that it's, like, not a big deal. And, um, and since, since it has become a big deal, I think it's much better to be... If you, if you, if you want the office, you, it should be because there's something you want to do there. Yeah. Yes. You want to do that. And actually, that people said about Trump, oh, this is ridic ridiculous. He's just a telepersonality. He's just a guy who's got a reality show. No one remembers 
that until he came down that escalator and said, Mexico's not sending us its best, there had been no, all the serious politicians hadn't said a serious thing. Uh, they'd all done the, uh, instead of the son of a dishwasher, John Kasich was doing, um, I'm proud to say I was born the son of a mailman. You can buy this ad from consultants like Michael Murphy. Oh, I, I thought I'd start with the son of a something ad. Oh, yeah, sure, what do you want? We've got dishwasher, uh, we've got mail, uh, we've got mailman, uh, we've got haberdasher, it worked for yeah. uh, Harry Truman. Uh, and, 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 the, uh, and there was no discussion of policy, whether you like it or not, until Trump said Mexico's not sent. That was the first policy injected into the race. You should... So even Trump, as despised as he is and was as just this TV reality show host, actually ran because there was something he wished to accomplish. And that's all I'm asking. But... So then, are, you're not skeptical of Boris? Or are you... I mean, because no. Boris does want to achieve something. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think... Is it, but is it for self-preservation he wants to achieve? No, that? I think he does, he, does, he does think he's Churchill, which is, at a certain level, slightly unhinged. Um, <laughs> the unhinged times call for an unhinged leader, yes, no? and Yes, and, but because he thinks he's Churchill, he, he thinks of uh, Brexit as his D-Day, and he thinks, so he's looking on October the 4th, uh, October 31st, uh, in, in, in the way that in 1944, uh, they were all looking at uh, June the 6th. And uh, he believes, for a practical reason, that Brexit has paralyzed UK politics, and that it's not possible for normal politics to resume until you put Brexit to bed. And that all these extensions that, oh, I think we'll have an extension until May 2021, until October 2027, that all that means is the paralysis is going to continue. And, and, and so it, the ruthlessness of Boris, and I, be, I believe him on this. He said the other day, he said, because uh, they're trying to force him to ask Brussels for an extension. It's humiliating. It's humiliating. The UK is in many ways a debauched and degraded place, but it is not formally a colony of this European superstate. <laughs> well, tell, and, tell, tell Brussels that. Yeah, and, and, and the idea of making him go there and grovel for an extension, he said he'd rather die in a ditch. That's actually a, a slight exaggeration. He wouldn't like to die in a ditch. He'd like, he'd like to die after having had a terrific dinner and going home and rogering this week's mistress senseless for four hours and then keel over from a massive heart attack. But he's broadly honest about the dying part. <laughs> yeah. It's quite an image. Mm. Quite an image. Yeah. <laughs> that I only got 175 quid for working for The Spectator. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm, still, I'm still at the, um, the four hours, which is pretty impressive, by the way. <laughs> please, please, darling. I, 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 please, darling. I, I have to say, I, 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 you know, okay. perhaps, perhaps, yeah, we may have to, okay, we'll may have to talk about that another time. Yes, um, darling. I was gonna, I, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to say the question that was, I was going to ask anyway before he said that was, can he pull it off? Do you like that? <laughs> um, <laughs> So I'm just going to say it anyway. So there you go. It's not, we're now we're so, going to send it into a carry-on movie. Stop that, you see? So we're, then we're going to stop that and be awfully correct and everything. Mm. So 31st of October, by, Phelim and I, by the way, are intending to... We are going to go to the UK to celebrate with, 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 uh, with the people there. I mean, um, so we've spent a bit of time in Ireland this summer. Mm. And um, what we found, which was really interesting, and here's, the, here's sort of the next question, was that the Brexit derangement syndrome, which is is unbelievably, remarkably similar to Trump derangement syndrome. And is that, actually a, is that actually an example of the globalization of madness? Is that a globalization yeah. of derangement, basically? Because they smell and look similar, or are they dissimilar, or is this globalization? No, I, I think globalization of derangement, I think that's actually a, a brilliant way of looking at it, because we have... Um, <laughs> 
So, and you heard that first on the Ann and yeah. Phelan Scoop. <laughs> Available on all good podcast platforms. Yeah, no, 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 you're wasting it on the podcast. You should save that for a book title. That's actually a, that's actually a good thing. But the, because, because TM. you have a group, essentially the entire developed world is run by people who all think alike. They often, uh, they actually often marry uh, each other. Yeah. The day, if you remember at Mandela's funeral, um, do you remember uh, they were all getting a bit bored by about yeah uh, the, Who was that? With the uh, <laughs> the guy the convict the guy who'd been convicted of necklacing who I lo- I must say I just said slight Sorry. detour I love I love the big American security thing because so you, like you have you have Air Force One uh, then you have the decoy Air Force One again most most government leaders don't have a plane never mind a decoy plane. <laughs> for the bad guys to shoot out of the sky uh, so they don't get the real plane. So they have Air Force One, uh, it lands, they've flown over the uh, 40-car motorcade all the way to South Africa for the funeral. They've got like five Brazilian Secret Service guys with the telephone cords hanging out of their ear, driving Obama to a football stadium where they stand him 18 inches away from a convicted schizophrenic guy, <laughs> convicted of putting a burning tire around the neck of some guy ah. and burning and setting him alight. It's a cultural and, thing. Uh, so the 40 car motorcade and the decoy Air Force One and the thousand guys with telephone wire hanging out of there did a great job <laughs> there in getting Obama safely uh, to stand next to the violent schizophrenic <laughs> convict. Brilliant, brilliant. <laughs> Uh, but Obama, after that bit, he's like sitting, uh, there's him and David Cameron and Hella Turning Schmidt, who was the hottie who was serving as Prime Minister of Denmark at that time. <laughs> Beautiful Scandinavian blonde. And they get bored during the 14th speech by the president of Chad or whatever it is. <laughs> And so uh, Obama and Cameron are all doing selfies with the Danish oh, yeah, pastry. Oh, yeah, that's right. And uh, and she and 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 what uh, uh, amazed me about that was that Hella Turning Schmidt is married to Stephen Kinnock, who is the uh, uh, European Commissioner, who's the son of Neil Kinnock, no way. who nobody remembers except for the fact that Joe Biden plagiarized him. Uh, in the speech uh, when he ran for president in 1988. So you have, you have a Welsh Euro commissioner married to a Danish prime minister. It's Obvious. actually like arranged marriages. Yeah, 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 yeah. When you watch some costume drama on PBS about medieval uh, monarchs, the Grand Duke of this is marrying the Margravine of that. That's actually how this globalist ruling class lives. Yes. Uh, and they all meet up at Davos and they all know what's best for us. And a lot of them, like your great compatriot, Peter Sutherland, Mm -hmm. uh, who no one knows the name of him, but he was a Goldman Sachs guy who wound up on the board of everything that matters. He testified that the ethnic nation state is over and every society needs to become a multicultural society. Nobody elected Peter Sutherland to say that. But he gets to meet with uh, the prime minister of this and the president of that and tell them what to do. Mm-hmm. And none of you, you guys, you can't find a polling station to vote out uh, people like Peter Sutherland. They've made themselves immune to that. They all fly around the world agreeing with each other. And so when you, when you uh, move outside of that consensus, when you vote for a Trump, when you vote for a Brexit, uh, when you vote for Salvini in Italy, uh, when you vote for Viktor Orban in Hungary, when you move outside the boundaries that these guys have determined for you, they get very upset about it. Yeah. It's the conventional wisdom uh, of the elites, uh, and they, they don't understand why you ingrates, you, you, you uh, ingrate masses, don't just agree that life works better when all these clever people jet around making plans for you. That's, yeah. that's how they do it. Yeah. Um, 
funny. We have on, on, on the show, on, the new, on this new podcast that we've started, we actually have a section that we're going to have every week on Trump derangement. And I mean, I kind of make a joke about it, but it's actually really sad. Um, traveling around the country, and I'm sure you have a favorite, a favorite derangement mm. story, but people who've had their children divorce them, grown children, mm. you know, I mean, I met a guy up in Carmel, a really nice guy, and he was... He has grown children who are like, you know, grown up and married and everything. And they've, they've broken up with him, you know, they've broken up with him. Yeah. And it's like he sends them birthday presents and, you know, sends Christmas cards, all this, whatever. And, they, they, you know, three years later or whatever. And it's like, <laughs> what is wrong with people? And, and, and you know, this, the, those stories are everywhere. I mean, my, my funny version of it is that I, you know, a hundred years ago, I lived in Italy and uh, shared a flat with a great girl, Christina, and I mean, f just fantastic. And uh, like, we were super pally, you know, but this is kind of before Facebook and all that. So I kind of, you know, I lost contact with her <laughs> over the years until uh. she found me on Facebook and broke up with me. So she got in <laughs> touch with me. She got in touch with me and said, you know, that, um, you know, you and me back in the day in Duskany, you know, and uh, we're done though, by the way, just so you know. <laughs> you know, we're over, we're over because I, you know, I, I can't, you know, go there with you because of, you know, because I had said something, you know, whatever, because I've got two Facebook pages. <laughs> um, I've got like the official Facebook page and then my actual fa Facebook page, that I, but, I, but I've messed it up. I've really, really messed it up. I've let people in there and it's like, you know, it just becomes this horror fest, uh, you know. Uh. But, um, but yeah, but she, yeah, yeah, she broke up with me. And those stories, I mean, have you got a favorite derangement story that you've heard? Well, there's, uh, there's the guy, what was it, the, 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 uh, the book he, uh, the book, he was like a hip author in the 80s. And um, I can't, his name will come to, what? No, uh, what was the name? Uh, no. Uh, oh, yeah, that's the hip guy. It'll come to me, it'll come to me. Uh, too late, but it'll, it'll, I'm having a Joe Biden moment here. Um, <laughs> It's, uh, it's contagious. Uh, and um, he, he's, he's like a, a, a hip Manhattan gay. Uh, a hugely successful novelist, very fashionable in the, in the 1980s. This is so, like a quiz now, by the way. Yeah, yeah. And so he's like a middle-aged guy. And uh, he he's like, has a nice young boyfriend who's like 20 years younger than him. And he actually voted for Hillary, but he's not deranged, this guy. But his boyfriend uh, just had a complete meltdown, can't function anymore. And so this guy, this middle-aged guy, he's living with this whiny, neurotic little twink who he thought was super cute when he saw him across a crowded room at some nightclub years ago. And he, now he can't stand the guy. The guy has become absolutely obsessed about yes. Trump, deranged yes. by Trump. Uh, and eventually, he, he wrote, as he, recent, as he recently did, a book saying that these, these, these guys just need to lighten up. If yes. Trump is actually preventing you having yeah. sex... That's, that's, that's wrong. That's just you're, wrong. You're just... You're not looking at things properly. Yeah. There's no... And I don't even... I don't even... You know, when, when you said that, uh, like, families... Uh, the couples are broken up because they can't... You know, the one guy... Well, you know... Uh, yeah, I voted for Hillary, but actually, I think Trump's not doing a bad job. Ooh, well, you're uh, you're sleeping on the couch tonight. I yeah. don't even, I don't even get that. I always, they, they always used to put me uh, years ago on BBC shows where they thought there'd be some fireworks. So they put me up against like some uh, hatchet-faced Marxist lesbian, and I'd. Uh, <laughs> And I'd always, like, about two bit, three minutes into the show, like, she'd be, like, going on about what a racist I was or whatever. And about three minutes into the show, I'd be going, wow, this Marxist lesbian looks really hot. And uh, <laughs> I'd be thinking, uh, it'd be kind of cool to turn a Marxist lesbian. Not, not, <laughs> not on the Marxism, obviously, but on the lesbianism. <laughs> I think I might have a sporting chance. She's really laying into me right now. And, uh, and so I don't even understand that, the, uh, the inability. You know, you've been, having, uh, you've been having sex with your husband for 15 years, and then he votes for Trump, and he can't... Uh, he, he's suddenly a completely different person, yeah. and the idea of sharing a bed with him utterly revolts you. I can't, I can't stand that. At, I can't... Un Understand that at all? It's very weird. To yeah, me. there's a lot of, and there's an awful lot of it around. Mm. Yeah, yeah, mm. and more of it. Hello. Yes. Hello. How are you doing? Okay. <laughs> <laughs>
Are we talking about the obituaries? You look very beautiful with that makeup <laughs> film. Can I just say? <laughs> Gorgeous. <laughs> yes. Well, no. um, okay, we're going to talk about the obituaries. Oh, we right? never talked about the Irish backstop, though, by the way. <laughs> uh, by the way, I'm actually, by the way, seriously, as a public service here, can you describe, can you tell people, describe, maybe, yeah, can you tell people what the Irish backstop is, Me? Philip? Me? Yeah, why not? It's why not you? <laughs> Why not you? We used to have a hard, so we used to have a hard border in Ireland. We didn't. Well, we did. Sorry, we did have a hard border. They used to get us off the buses. So you'd be if you went. So I went to college in Dublin, and to go home to my to my family home, She's which is also side. in the Republic, also in the Republic. The quickest way is for the bus to go through the north, through the north. So the, the bus would come to the border, and they'd get out, and, and you know there was quite a lot of argy bargy. They'd get everyone out of the bus, get out of the bus, mm. and make you stand in the rain for a mm. while just mm. to piss you off, and mm. then get you back on the bus but again. That, that was nothing to do with the EU. That was because Mark's because relatives were, were killing my relatives. Correct, they were blowing <laughs> them up. And, <laughs> and my we did a good, and by the way, we did a, yes, relatives. our people did a good job of blowing up the other people. Yes, too. that was nothing to do with the <laughs> European Union. It was like there was actual, it was actual. It's called a border. I have, you know, you always say this as if I've personally assassinated five members of your family. I had a great uncle who was given a full military funeral by the IRA. Oh, which isn't that is, lovely? Uh, oh, uh, yeah. You must How be so proud. That? Any IRA yeah. supporters in the house tonight? <laughs> 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 yeah. No, so the, ba the, the I mean, the backstop is, a, is an Irish myth. It's, it's, it, it was just created to stop Brexit. It, yeah, there's no yeah. actual reality to it. It's like the idea that, that you, you know, I mean... I remember English people coming over to, to Ireland and going through the Northern Ireland border. I mean, it was worse than the Berlin Wall. Like, there were sandbags, yeah, machine yeah, guns, yeah. armoured cars, tanks, the whole yeah. thing, barbed wire. It was, uh, you know, for us, it was just like going out for milk, right? Yeah, but yeah. For, for anyone who wasn't used to it, it was a, probably a frightening experience. But that was because people were bringing bombs and guns yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, across the border, not uh, cows and uh, pasteurised <laughs> milk. You know? No, no. Uh, so the idea that, that they would bring back this, this militarized border, uh, and that's what the backstop is. The backstop is we must have free movement between the borders. But, if but, we don't but, but before the, the troubles, as, as they were called, like in 1922, when that border was drawn, people just go back and forth across it all, all day long, far more easily than they do uh, over, say, the... Uh, Quebec, New Hampshire border, which one I happen to know. My, my, uh, w w once you're not having bombs, the border itself is whatever it wants to be. Yeah. My, my daughter and I were in beautiful County Down a couple of years ago, and we set off to, I had an appointment in Dublin, so we set off, and I said to my daughter, oh, uh, we're, um, we're coming up to the border. Prepare yourself. <laughs> and uh, and she's <coughs> thinking, I mean, like the U.S.-Canadian border, where you know some bored guy, because it's a, a Vermont border post that gets two cars an hour, so he's got nothing better to do than detain us for forty minutes while he uh, asks us increasingly ridiculous questions. Uh, she was she was bracing for that, and instead we're just driving on the motorway, and um, the. Uh, Blue UK signs suddenly turn to green uh, EU signs, uh, and I think it. I think the road is actually called the E two seven three because you can drive to Odessa on it under the uh, insane uh, highway management yeah. of the European Union. Uh, and so it, you change this from the blue UK signs to the green EU signs, and it changes from miles to kilometres because. Yeah. Yeah. Anne is so Anne is completely fluent in, in metric and loves all the kilometers. And and we just fly through it at 75 miles an hour. And uh, and I, uh, my daughter said, wait, well, what kind of border post is that? Yeah. There isn't. <laughs> and we're completely, f nothing happened. Nothing happened to us. The car didn't cease to function. Yeah. And the doors fall off and it sputtered to a halt. And now everyone said, oh, my God, if we don't get a backstop, where if we don't have the Irish backstop, we're completely screwed here. Life will cease. Yeah. Uh, it's like, it's, again, it's, it's this alliance between all the clever people. Yes. yes. Uh, so some politician introduces the word backstop, the media pick up on it, and suddenly if you switch on the BBC, if backstop, you switch backstop, on backstop, RTE, backstop, yeah. it's like backstop, backstop. backstop, backstop. I was saying to Phelan, it's like here it would be like 
uh, America's greatest drinking game. If you like, took a shot every time anyone's a backstop, you're like, <laughs> you know. Yeah. That's a drinking game I can get behind. And there's, there's, there's people, like, there's little villages at the, the, the border like snakes. That, oh, I don't know what's going to happen on October 31st. I guess I won't be seeing you for a few years yeah. if Boris has his way and there's no backstop. It's been nice knowing you. Yeah. Uh, and this great mythical... Uh, the best thing, actually, about the backstop was when Trump uh, either intentionally or unintentionally misunderstood it. And he's standing with Leo Varadkar... Uh, the, the Taoiseach uh, of Ireland uh, at their meeting. And, he, and Trump's asked a question about his wall on the southern border. Yeah. And, he, uh, and he makes a reference to Leo Varadkar about uh, a, a wall on uh, Leo Varadkar's northern border, as if, yeah. <laughs> as, as, if, uh, as if Varadkar is actually advocating for some Berlin Wall type thing. On the north, and in fact, if you were to, if if Trump were to just say, uh, "I'm scrapping plans. I'm scrapping plans for a wall on the southern border. Instead, we're going to have a backstop." Oh. He would completely, <laughs> yeah, yeah. He would completely screw, yeah, yeah. Uh, the entire <laughs> the entire political conversation on which, that one, which, which he's which he's managing mm -hmm. to do anyway. Mm. Um, I, I, funny, I, it's interesting you mentioned the Berlin Wall because it's a perfect segue into my next thing, except for, except for I just wanted to mention one thing, which was, um, so when we were in the UK, um, I'm talking to Claire Fox, by the way, who's an mm. MEP for the Brexit Party, and she was describing, and I don't know if, how, how well so many people know about this Brexit thing, it is kind of an extraordinary thing that the people voted in a referendum. And that, you know, in lots of parts of Britain, a bit like in California, your vote, you know, your vote often doesn't count. Mm. Um, mm. But in Brexit, every vote counted. And they made it really clear to people that their vote, vote counted. The most right. important and vote Claire, of the generation. And Claire was, like, travelling around the country, and she said, like, that, you know, she'd go... She, like, went to her hairdresser in, like, in Wales, you know, some, some regular person who said, um, oh, we did a big debate about it last night in the house. And, you know, Joe, like Joe, he's very good on the computer. He did the Googling. So Joe did the Googling, and the rest of us, what we did was put a big chart up, the pros and the cons. Uh, so people took it super, yeah. super seriously, yeah. like the people doing the Googling in Wales. And those people, three <laughs> years later, three years later, you know, this thing hasn't happened. Um, and, I, I, you know, if it doesn't happen, I, I just think Britain, well, certainly the Conservative Party are done. You know, I think they're gone. Well, um, I, I think it would also be, uh, you, you would see that actually we have moved into a post-democratic age. Yeah. Yes. If you listen to the arguments uh, the globalists make, the basic argument is that it's, uh, everything now is too complicated for, for, ordinary, for ordinary people, people. You're too to stupid understand. To vote. Yeah. Uh, which is basically saying uh, the masses are just too stupid. Yeah. That's, that's sort of baked into democracy. That is the nature of it. Democracy... Uh, presumes that some guy who is the most brilliant mind, uh, when it comes to determining the arrangements for the government of the jurisdiction he's in, uh, his, his absolutely brilliant mind has the same weight as some guy who left school at 11 and doesn't know anything. Yeah. And, and so the arguments are becoming explicitly anti-democratic. Democratic. They're oh, yeah. saying, oh, Brexit, people didn't understand uh, what they were being asked Correct. to vote for. Yeah. Yeah. You, could make, you could make that argument about anything. Oh, but, uh, yeah, yeah. And you could, uh, likewise, with, with Trump, people, who, people, one reason why the left clings desperately to the, the Russian collusion thing is, the, is because they can't actually believe that rational people, that they live and walk among every day of their lives. Because if you think, if you have the Trump derangement syndrome, uh, it's, you can avoid uh, all the states that voted for Trump. If you're in California, you can avoid all the inland areas that voted for Trump. But even when you're like uh, just uh, walking down Sunset Boulevard in, in, uh, in Los Angeles, you know that all around you, maybe 30% of the people, there's people there who voted for Trump. Uh, 
You can't believe that. Yes. <laughs> it's easier to do like Hillary and say, no, 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 no. It was the Macedonian content farmers <laughs> who, yes. who stole who stole the elect because they do not believe yes. that rational people yep. would calculate it's in their own interest to vote for Trump, to vote for Brexit, to vote for Victor Orban, to vote for any it, well, it, people. It, the problem is it's a genuine belief, mm. right? Mm. And you've often said, you know, you're in the persuasion business, mm. not, not the pundit group. How do you persuade these people who genuinely don't believe that people voted for Trump or people support Trump? How do you persuade them otherwise? How do you get there? How do you? Well, I, I, think, you, I think you have to start with the realities of life because um, I think it's per it, was, it was perfectly obvious to me, and it's not even a partisan point, um, because, in, in a sense, Trump is not a Republican. He simply uh, uh, used that as a vehicle of convenience to get himself elected. But Trump saw something uh, that most uh, professional politicians did not, which was that the conventional choice did not work for most people. Um, and I think if you actually go out to certain, the part of New Hampshire I live in, the part of Maine that Tucker Carlson lives in, you well, you well understand the disconnect between the base and the, uh, and the, and the political class. And that's actually what uh, the discussion is about, that the purpose of a political class is not to, you know, Prince Harry gets attacked for jetting around the world to advise you to lower your carbon footprint. <laughs> so he like took four private flights yeah, yeah. in the last 11 weeks, days yeah, yeah. to lecture you guys on how your carbon yeah, footprint yeah. is too big. And I don't really, I, I understand why people are mad at that, but I don't really begrudge it because he's, you know, he, he, the, 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 per, the point of Prince Harry is, is not in that sense um, to, to, to represent the interests of the people. So if he wants to do that, that's fine. That's fine by, uh, by whatever he wants. But the purpose of a political class is to be the representatives of the people so that they can govern themselves. And in, in June of 2015, you had one party, the Democrats, who were talking about boutique niches nobody had ever heard of. Um, you know, uh, so it's one thing... So when, 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 when you talk about the, trans, uh, the transgender thing, uh, that affects a very small number of people. Meanwhile, there are millions and millions of people whose mills and factories are closed down, and nobody ever talks about no. them. Yeah. The, uh, identity politics, the smaller the identity group gets, the more, more th the, the left invests in it. Yeah. Meanwhile, on the right... Uh, Clearly, after the Bush years, the idea of this sort of uh, just uh, kind of uh, going into countries, uh, toppling whatever happens to be there at the time, uh, and then dithering around for 10, 20, 30, 70 years, however long it takes, there was no appetite for that among the Republican uh, base. So you have someone like uh, Lindsey Graham who wants boots on the ground everywhere. Um, something happened, I think it was in Chad or Mali, and uh, he immediately called Lindsey Graham, he's a very nice fellow, but he immediately called for boots on the ground in Chad or Mali, uh, wherever it was. And it turned out America already had boots on the ground in Chad or Mali. <laughs> and he said, I had no idea. Yeah. In that case, we need more boots on the yeah. ground there. Yeah. And actually, nobody in Chad or Mali wears boots on the ground. <laughs> they're, they're, walking around, uh, they're walking around barefoot. So the only people in any kind of footwear are Americans. It's a completely ludicrous thing. And, and um, it means nothing. If you're in, in a broken down New Hampshire town where your grandfather had a farm and your father worked a, a, at a mill uh, and now all that's gone and, uh, your, uh, and your daughter does the night shift at the quickie crap and your and your and your son is a small time heroin dealer because that's actually more rewarding work than doing the night shift yeah. at the quickie crap and these this, this is a this is a the disconnect between 
I think it's explaining the disconnect between, be, be, between where certain Americans live and, and where millions and millions of Americans mm -hmm. whose lives are getting worse actually live. And that, I think that's, 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 the key that's to persuasion. what Trump found. Yeah. <laughs> so we want to move on now because we're actually running out of time and I had a whole section here I wanted to talk about Passing Parade, the amazing book that Mark wrote about uh, with, filled with obituaries and particularly the Ted Kennedy one, which we can't do today. We may have to do this again. <laughs> what we want to get on to, which is something I think the burning question that everyone here has, is to ask about cats. And that's not cats with a K. <laughs> Some of you got that. It is cats with a C. And the big question obviously is indoor or outdoor? Well, I, why are they laughing? <coughs> I like because they have cats. No. Cats. How did this start with you? Where did this start? How well, this start? I, I like I like uh, I, I like cats. My my first when well I had cats growing up. Uh, then when I was eighteen or nineteen, I was a, I started as a, a teenage disc jockey at small town stations, and somebody gave me a little kitten because. Uh, they were moving to a flat where they couldn't have a little kitten or whatever. So I got this little kitten called Elliot. And, Sorry, um, again? Elliot. Elliot. A little, little gray kitten called Elliot. And one of the first big uh, things I did in uh, radio was I did a big uh, Christmas show with Andy Williams, uh, uh, in which Andy was my special guest. And it was, uh, and it was terrific, terrific fun for... I was a teenager, and I'm talking to Andy Williams, wow. it was a big, big thing. And I do the show, and I get it on big reel-to-reel -reel tape, open reel tape, if you know uh, what that is. And, um, uh, and, it, uh, and it was terrific. It began with Andy saying, hi, everybody. It's great to be with uh, Mark Stein to wish you all a fabulous Merry Christmas. And then it went into, it's the most wonderful, Andy singing, it's the most wonderful time of the year, whatever. So I do the big Andy Williams Christmas show, get the open reel tape, take it home to my uh, flat. I come back home oh God, to no. my little apartment. No, 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 no. And I open the front door, and there's my cute little uh, uh, kitten, Elliot, playing with a ball of string. And I think, oh, isn't that cute? And then I think, uh, wait a minute. Uh, oh, no. Why is he playing with a, a ball of wool? I don't, I don't knit. <laughs> and I realized to my horror that he's, uh, he's playing with, he's chewing up the start of the Andy Williams Christmas show. <laughs> so, so he chewed up all the bit where he was going, uh, hi everybody, I'm Andy Williams. And I had to go through, I, I found the tape, I, I, I whirled it all back on, and I had to take it back to the radio station and find bits where he used the same uh, uh, consonant and vowel sounds oh. in the course of the... So my great Andy Williams Christmas show began with Andy going, I ever reborn, <laughs> <laughs> welcome. And... Uh, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm, asked, I'm asked a lot, what is, what, is, what is true love? What is true love? True, true love. It's not murdering uh, a cat. Boundless, uh, boundless love. Uh, absolutely love without borders. The purest kind of love there is, is keeping a kitten who's eaten the front of the Andy Williams yeah. Christmas tree. <laughs> it's, uh... Yeah. 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 Okay, go to the cocktail for us. So, um, I, I really would like to, I think we should have a whole session on cats for the cat people here. Um, just quickly, how many cat people have we got here? Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What's your present cat called? Uh, I've, I've got, a, I, my third, I had a third cat who I miss very much, is in a music video made actually, because oh, he's yeah. a hugely corpulent cat. Yes. yes. Um, and uh, TJ, who died uh, about just a little under a year ago, um, so I have... Uh, two cats at the moment called Marvin and Bron, and then a little outdoor kitty who has uh, just taken a light. He's figured I'm a big softy, and uh, and so uh, he he swings by twice a day just to uh, just to hang out. But he's like standoffish. I do I, the thing I like about cats, uh, Rudyard Kipling. Uh, the cat that walked by himself, which is from the uh, Just So stories. And this idea that the cat, you can domesticate anything. You can domesticate a dog, 
You can domesticate a goat, you can domesticate a cow. You can never really domesticate a cat because no matter how fond and cuddly and purring a cat is, a cat will eventually, less like uh, one, at one point, will just want to go and you know, sit in a tree and sort of stare at you with a look of cool contempt yeah. for, <laughs> for a couple of hours. A cat is very, in my experience, a cat is very much like a woman in that respect, you know. It's oh! like, and, uh, and, and, uh, no, 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 you know what I, you know what I mean. It's like sometimes they need their, I'm just talking about the Marxist lesbian on the BBC again. <laughs> it, goes, it like goes, it goes well for 10, 15 minutes, but then she wants to go up and uh, sit in a tree and look down on you with a look of uh, pure contempt. They're very <coughs> similar in that respect. We're running out of time. So the last thing that we do with all our guests on the podcast is we have these three questions and, um, I, I, and I, I definitely want to get to, to all three of them. The first one is, we ask everyone if you, uh, what's your go-to recipe that you cook um, and that you could produce on, on demand? Well, I, I, uh, when I first moved to, to New Hampshire, uh, and I wasn't married or anything, I, I, and I had some uh, guys working at the house, because uh, I bought a 200-year-old farmhouse that needed about 200 years of work doing, so... <laughs> I was the biggest source of employment uh, in town. As I think it was George W. Bush said, we need uh, foreigners to come to America to hire Americans to do the jobs foreigners won't do. So yeah, I, was, yeah, yeah, yeah. I was employing all these guys working on the house, and, and uh, the contractor was his birthday, so he invited me up to his little place by the lake and uh, to come to the birthday party. And I gathered from the women in the general store uh, that you were supposed to cook something. And as I was a bachelor, I, I cooked something. And I started off to make a, uh, a Boston cream pie, which everyone knows. It's like an American staple. Um, but it, uh, because I had this old oven that was a bit quirky, it didn't, it didn't work quite. So the sponge came out, sort of wasn't really usable enough for the two layers. Uh, so I, I found the bit that was like a kind of usable top layer. And then I was like thinking about what I could do for the base, and I decided to just do a graham cracker crust with that. And then I take, I take that to the party, and of course all the guys are standing around in plaid, and I'm a, arriving with my dainty little dish. <laughs> and uh, they say, he's even more of an effete, uh, sinister, foreign, uh, you know, so they were very suspicious. And then uh, the, uh, the guy's wife, he cut, she cut it all up into pieces, and they go, Hmm, hey, Mark, this is really good. I was a hero to big, butch, bearded men in plaid uh, because of this modification I'd made. So the next time around, this is how I, I started making more modifications over the, over the years so that this all-American staple, uh, Boston cream pie, actually became as sinister and, uh, and exotic as, as me. And I replaced the, 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 the top layer of sponge, having replaced the bottom with a graham cracker crust, I replaced the middle uh, one with uh, da what they call um, daquoise uh, from, uh, um, uh, I think, from Dax in France by the Spanish border. Very sophisticated. And, uh, and it's like a meringue, but you, you shave almonds and hazelnuts into it. So it's like nuttier and crunchier. Oh. Than, it's like chewier. Nice. And so I'd use that one, and then I'd, so I'd have the Boston cream pie and... Uh, and um, and then the lower lay layer, I'd have like a mousse with little bits of, uh, a light mousse with bits of fruit in it. So it started off as an all-American Boston cream pie, and then it's being hollowed out from underneath <laughs> by all these foreign elements. I, I, so I always say it's, uh, it's as American as apple pie a la mode. And that's, uh, and that's, uh, and that's my... I think, I think everyone deserves a photograph of that at one point. And normally what we do with guests is we get them to photograph uh, uh, their concoction. Uh, this, is a, this is a beautiful thing to behold, I imagine. Uh, uh, so I think we need to see it. Um, I may be asking for a, for a photograph. The second thing we ask people is, what's their favorite cocktail mocktail? And I have to tell a very funny, tiny story here. Mark came to visit us recently in California. And... Um, and I decided to try, because, I, because I'm a massive devotee of Costco. <laughs> I just love Costco so much. It's not even funny, you know. I mean, I literally would do free advertising for them. I probably do, actually, like everybody else who's a member of Costco. Because I, I love them, and I think they're marvelous and everything. I brought home their Kirkland champagne, which I 
tried out on Mark, we both decided it was a... Yeah, yeah. It wasn't working. Yeah. So what's your favorite tipple? Well, actually, I was in, in, uh, in, in France uh, a few months ago, up in the Haute Alp, uh, and they have a little aperitif there that I thought I'd misheard at first because, because they call it P.P. de Marmot. <laughs> and... Sounds like something the cat did. And, uh, <laughs> and if you, uh, and uh, I know we have a couple of francophones here, you'll know that means basically groundhog pee-pee. <laughs> and, uh, and, it's, and it's a popular aperitif just in this uh, little uh, corner of France. And uh, I was, I, I confess, I was slightly put off by the name because I wouldn't have thought it met uh, EU health and safety codes. Um, but in actual fact, it's, it's, uh, it's strong. Um, it has a hell of a kick, but it is absolutely delicious. So I, I certainly, I hope all those incontinent groundhogs in the, uh, in the out, out corner of France uh, just, uh, just, just spray on groundhogs. You're doing, you're doing all of us in that part of the world a huge favor. I love that stuff. And the last question we ask, and then I want to talk, just men mention, the, mention the podcast again and tell people how to find it, um, is your favorite, and it's re this is really hard, particularly to ask you this. I mean, uh, asking other people might be a little bit easier, but to ask you this, um, your favorite work of art, and that could be anything. It can be a book, it can be a poem, it could be um, like a sculpture, a painting. What, that's, I know it's a horrible question, yeah. but let's say for today, what's your favorite work of art? Well, the, I, I like things I go back to again and again. Um, Josef Roth, uh, an, an Austrian guy, wrote a great novel about the twilight of the Habsburg Empire, where in parts of it he's in the head of uh, the Emperor Franz Josef. Uh, and it, so it's about the twilight of the Habsburg Empire through three generations of a family. And everyone in the book knows that this world is coming to an end without ever actually quite being able to, to say it. And I, the first time I read it, I read it because I thought it was an interesting book. When I went back to it, I read it in the light of what is happening to our world, to some of the oldest nation states on the planet, to Western civilization in general. And it's an absolutely a brilliant novel for making you uh, think about that. I'll, I'll, throw in a, I'll throw in a painting that's a sort of similar thing to me too, and that is by Lady Butler, who was a great war artist, and unusually for a female painter at that time, and her painting of, it's called The Remnants of an Army, and it shows the last survivor of, uh, of a British force, the Bengal Army, in the Second Afghan War in 1842, the lone survivor, one man, he was a, uh, I think an assistant surgeon or something, just hanging off the back of a dead horse, approaching the gates of Jalalabad, uh, having survived, the, the lone survivor of the 1842 Second Afghan War by Lady But It's a magnificent painting, and of course, in light of more recent experiences in Afghanistan and elsewhere, it's very pertinent. And then if I just, I, I tell you what, I just tell you what, and that is uh, a portrait, a famous portrait by <clears throat> uh, John Singer Sargent, who was neither a singer nor a sergeant, uh, but he was a great American portrait painter, and he did a fantastic, famous painting of uh, Lady Agnew, uh, which hangs in the National Portrait Gallery of Scotland. And years ago, I took a girl there uh, who wanted to see it, and I thought, oh, God, I'm not really interested in uh, being dragged around an art gallery because... Uh, you, you know, if you're, if you're taking a girl out, you don't want to be, like, staring at a lot of pictures traipsing around from room to room for her. And we got to the portrait of Lady Agnew by Sargent, and she looked just like the woman in the paint. It's a beautifully... It's a slightly bigger shot, uh, chair than this, and she's, like, uh, leaning on it, uh, looking f sort of kind of languid and enigmatic uh, as, she, as she stares toward the painter, which is languid and enigmatic is good. If you're like wandering around on the deck later tonight, 11 o'clock in the evening, and you see a woman in a slightly oversized chair looking languid and enigmatic, don't pass that up. It's, uh, it's not as <laughs> frequent as you think. And, and, this, and this girl I was with looked just 
just like her. And uh, it was, uh, and so I bought I, something I never do. I bought the gift book at the gift shop, which has that painting on the cover. And uh, I had about the uh, best weekend of my life after that. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, uh, so that's they're, they're three things that have okay. always stayed with me. First of all, yeah. we need to say we'll be signing books and uh, with our DVDs after this. Yes. Um, also, special announcement. Uh, you may know oh, that yes. we did the FBI Lovebirds play in FBI Lovebirds on the covers <laughs> in you. Washington D.C., uh, which is the text messages of Peter Strzok and Lisa Page as read uh, read live on stage. For, for special for the Mark Stein cruise. It's going to be reenacted on Tuesday in the finale with Mark Stein and playing, Michelle. Mark Stein playing Peter Strzok and Michelle Bachman playing Lisa Page. <laughs> Dream so. casting. Yeah. <laughs> it was either that or Robert Wagner and Jill St. John. So they yeah, decided. Yeah, yeah, that. No, that, I think that. I think. I think we need to get it. We need to get our seats early for that. Thank you very much. This is. This is the. This is. We're coming to the end. We are at the end of this episode of the Anne and Phelan Scoop, which was extremely special and very wonderful. And when I look at what we planned to talk about, we left out all kinds of wonderful things. Um, and I would highly recommend this book um, with uh, Passing Parade with all the obituaries. The one obituary that's not in here that we really love is, and if you haven't read it, the Ted Kennedy obituary is just something, a beautiful thing forever. It was so, so good they plagiarized it for a Hollywood movie. Yeah, and they yeah. plagiarized it for, Ch for Chappaquiddick. And we have a great Chappaquiddick story, which we won't tell here, but perhaps in the bar later. Um, <laughs> so for anyone who has not already, because we have dozens and dozens of people have already subscribed to our podcast, so we need more than dozens and dozens. So please do subscribe to the Annan's Film Scoop on everywhere that you can um, find it, and it's also on YouTube. And thank you very, very much, Mark, for, for having us again on the cruise. This is incredible. You have such... There's, I think the great thing about this cruise, and I think everyone here is all smugly knowing that, is that you attract a very um, interesting, appealing fun, loving, great gang of people. And so it's really great yeah, to be no, together. No, that's, that's true. You're, you're the other guys amazing. Yeah. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank thank you, you Anne, much. and uh, thank you, Anne and Phelan. These, these, these guys are, are the backstop or no backstop. These guys <laughs> are the absolute best. Thank, right. you. thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Thank you, guys. Mm -hmm.